Okay, so then moving on to chapter 21. This is on page 392 in your book. Uh, if you're listening to this, go ahead and give yourself a good pat on the back. You have made it not only to the last chapter of uh, this week's lectures, but also the last chapter of this book. Uh, it's a very uh, sentimental moment. You're about to read the very last one. Okay, so then this one is where we really wanna talk about um, like overall looking at our patients and giving them some sort of nutritional assessment and then how we go about educating our patients as dental hygienists because we're not dental uh, registered well not dental we are dental uh, but we're not registered dietitians and so uh, you know what exactly is our role when it comes to nutritional assessments um, and we're going to get into basically that health is multidimensional and it's an interprofessional concept. So that means that, you know, we maybe see uh, some type of symptom that appears to be systemic. That's our opportunity to work with a, a registered dietitian to, you know, give that patient the very best of care. Um, anytime we can refer over to medical or to uh, nutritional or any type of other, you know, dermatology kind of things, that's interprofessional uh, collaborations. That there is a relationship between nutrition and the oral cavity is very clearly established. That is not a question for us, uh, but that doesn't mean that other professions say it that way. So, and, you know, we want to make sure we um, are very good at our jobs in order to kind of help educate the public um, so we can, you know, do the very best by our patients. And then a nutritional assessment is going to involve compiling and comparing data about the patients from various resources in order to provide a meaningful evaluation and effective communication, right? Uh, we want to be able to uh, gather as much information about that person as possible in order to gear our recommendations to them in a very specific uh, way just for them. So uh, evaluating the patient. So for effective education, a comprehensive picture of the patient is essential. Does this mean we take a really good picture of them? No, doesn't. we're not taking photographs. Um, it's, it's that we gather all of the information about that person. You know, not only what are their needs and, you know, where are they at in their sort of um, life and development, but also, you know, what do they like? What's their culture? What's their, you know, geography? What's their demographic? Uh, we want to have a good idea about you know, what this person feels is important and, you know, how this person feels about food and about, you know, maybe taking nutritional advice from a dental hygienist. Um, we want to have a really good idea of this person before we are able to educate them effectively. Can we give information to patients, uh, you know, that we maybe we don't know every single thing about? Of course. But the more information we have about our patient, the better we're going to do with this. If information is gathered uh, incomplete, right, we don't have enough, then our treatment plan isn't going to be very good for that patient. You know, what if we uh, ask that patient and they say, you know, that they don't eat red meat and we're like, oh, you must be iron deficient, but it's like they're not iron deficient. We didn't even bother to ask them you know, uh, what their tests were or, or get a blood panel or anything like that. So, so we can't necessarily say without a comprehensive look at our patient whether or not they're healthy. And, and if we make a recommendation, it may not be the best one. And then we need to figure out what their needs are. And that's going to be through their health history, their psychosocial history, and their dental history. So we're going to talk about each one of those. All right, so sometimes when patients come in and you start asking them questions, um, you know, maybe it's about their medication list or especially if you start asking them questions about their diet, they may not report very valuable information, right? They may not give you a very comprehensive look at it for a number of reasons. So for one, maybe they think it's irrelevant. Why do you need to know? You're just a, you know, you just clean my teeth. Um, 
or maybe they're a little nervous about coming to the dental office. Maybe they have some kind of condition or, or something like that that makes them afraid. Um, you know, or maybe they just have regular old dental anxiety too. You know, any, anything that's going to cause them to um, be afraid of you and afraid of the dental work they're going to have is going to prevent proper communication. Uh, maybe they're confused by the question. They're like, what do you mean? What do I eat? I eat food. Um, you know, maybe you need to be very specific about the kinds of questions you ask, or maybe they totally forgot. So I don't know about you guys, but I can barely remember what I did yesterday. So, um, you know, if you ask me, Hey, what do you, what did you eat for the last three days? I'm going to be like, I have no idea what I ate. I, I don't remember what I had for breakfast kind of thing. Um, so maybe they just don't know. So any number one, uh, any, uh, any number of those things can affect the kinds of information your patient's going to give you. Uh, so whenever you're doing a nutritional screening um, during those initial steps, you want to be pretty careful. Uh, you want to be kind of paying attention to some of those signs that you know your patient doesn't understand, or uh, you know if they kind of give you vague answers, you're going to want to kind of kind of come up with more probing questions. Um, they're designed to identify health-related considerations and side effects uh, from medications putting a patient at nutritional risk. So, um, you know, when we do the nutritional sort of counseling, we're looking to see, okay, here's the foods that you eat and here are the medications you take. You know, from our understanding of nutrition, you know, how at risk are you for, you know, um, not having whatever uh, you know, nutrient it is. Maybe your patient takes hydrochlorothiazide, right? That's a very common medication. Um, and it will cause a patient to um, be low in potassium. So a lot of patients who take hydrochlorothiazide, they either need to eat more potassium in their diet or they need to be taking a potassium supplement of some kind, right? Or, um, you know, maybe they don't need it. Maybe they go and get their blood work done regularly and, and they had plenty last time they went and got their blood checked. Um, we want to be paying attention to changes like in taste, appetite, increased risk for dental problems, uh, gastrointestinal distress, nausea, vomiting, xerostomia. Um, those are going to be all side effects that uh, will show up in our health history questions. So, you know, when we're asking or we're looking at their medications list and we're like, oh, it looks like you take 12 different medications. They all cause xerostomia do you have a xerostomia? You know, we're not going to say that. You're going to say, do you have dry mouth? Do you ever notice that you have dry mouth? Because sometimes you'll say, do you have dry mouth? And they'll be like, no, no, I don't have that problem. Because they're thinking about right now. Now there's plenty of saliva because they're nervous. But maybe when they wake up in the morning, they do have dry mouth. So you have to be pretty careful with your questions. And then um, you may want to ask open-ended questions. So, um, you know, hey, when in the day do you do this thing? Or, you know, when was the last time this happened to you? You want to ask those kinds of questions that get them giving you more than yes or no answers. Uh, you want to ask, obviously, the frequency whenever um, they report alcohol or tobacco use. Um, with alcohol, it's a little bit more uh, vague because um, we don't necessarily mark all of our patients who, you know, have more than five alcoholic beverages uh, in a sitting um, as alcoholics, right? They're not, that's not necessarily the case. They may, um, you know, not be in that category, but, um, you know, if there's someone who has a problem with alcohol, that is something we want to mark down. Um, and then anytime they have any changes in their taste or ability to chew. So um, this one is, you know, maybe they had periodontal, uh, non-surgical therapy, um, so they had scaling and root planning, and then we gave them chlorhexidine rinse to take home. Uh, they switched with it, and they come back and they're like, everything tastes like metal. Why does everything taste like metal, right? Uh, we wanna be paying attention to those kinds of things. Whenever we're asking patients about their psychosocial history, we want to be identifying factors that will influence their food intake. You know, so, uh, if they're vegan, then they're going to have different food intake, right? Than someone who is omnivorous. Um, 
we're going to ask them questions to obtain uh, mostly through conversation and they're usually will tell us something that will prompt us to ask another question right we want to have those open-ended questions that kind of lead them down the path um, you know with this there's no there's no good way to like say you know if they if you ask them this question and they give you this answer, then you ask them this question, right? It's one of those things through, you know, learning all of the different factors that we need to be paying attention to with our patients. Um, you kind of pick up the sort of path that you take. So when your patients discuss, you know, one thing, then, you know, here are the three maybe options that you might ask of them about. Um, understanding reasons for food choices and considering their emotional patterns provide directions for suggesting dietary modifications. So, you know, if you, the reason that your patient has tons of cavities is because they drink Mountain Dew, you know, 24 seven because they are, um, you know, a video gamer and, you know, you're not going to convince that person to not drink something during video games like that's you're not going to get that right so what you want to do is give that patient something that is you know equally appealing as Mountain Dew you know maybe it's um sparkling water or something like that and you you want to kind of guide them down the path because you're not going to be able to say hey give up soda right they're not going to do that you want to kind of figure out the sort of surroundings around the foods that they're eating in order to make changes And then as far as their dental history, we want to have that knowledge of how their patients perceive or value their oral health in order to kind of develop our strategies. So, you know, if your patient's like, I don't care about my teeth, I have no interest in learning anything, you know, then just give them the bare minimum of, of information. If they don't want to hear it, you're going to offend them by continually kind of talking to them and then kind of forcing information down their, their throat. Um, usually there's something behind things like that. So if they're like, no, I don't care. Maybe it's that they, they don't want to hear about this because they think you're trying to sell them something. So, you know, that's a good time to just ask questions about, um, you know, well, well, what do you think about this? Or, or, you know, why do you feel that way? Or, you know, maybe I can, you know, give you something that you already have, or maybe I can give you a free product or, you know, something like that, where you can kind of figure out why people are behaving the way that they are and what their sort of incentive is in doing it in order to, to kind of figure out your best path. Um, the most effective technique for gathering a medical, social, and dental history for the dental professional is to interview the patient. It doesn't feel like an interview, but you absolutely do it every time they sit down. So we want to assess their nutritional status. Um, and a thorough assessment is going to provide that dental professional with enough information about their patient in order to determine their nutritional status. Um, so whenever our patients are experiencing medical or dental complications, that assessment is going to help us and kind of give us a guide for what we need to be paying attention to, right? It's going to tell us, hey, you know, your patient could potentially be anemic. We're seeing signs of this. They're telling us this in their diet and, and you know, this is how they look. Um, so, you know, it's possible this patient is anemic. Maybe we want to refer them over to their primary care physician. Um, the next part is clinical observation. So um, we are going to be looking at our patient and their physical appearance. Um, so is your patient underweight or overweight or, you know, kind of the normal weight? Um, while it does tell us everything about their nutritional status, right? It tells us a lot about their caloric balance. Um, it doesn't tell us, you know, whether or not that patient is healthy. It just gives us some information. So if our patient, you know, is terribly underweight, then there's a good chance maybe that they have, well, they certainly have a calorie deficit, but there's a chance they maybe have like a protein uh, deficiency as well. And then um, has the patient's weight changed significantly since the last visit? So I remember there were several times where my patients came in and, and they were like, way skinnier than they were before and I'd be like oh my gosh what happened you know and it was like 
my wife had surgery and I had to take care of her or, uh, you know, maybe they had bariatric surgery or, you know, something had, had happened along the way that um, caused them to change. Um, another thing we're going to be paying attention to is the, the overall look of their hair, fingernails, skin tone, and the, uh, it's a skin color and tone, right? So um, if they have an iron deficiency, we're going to be seeing that in their fingernails, right? If the patient has anemia, then they're going to probably be a bit paler than they maybe were before. Um, if they have a vitamin A toxicity, right, they have too much vitamin A, then they could get alopecia, which is where they lose their hair, and colosis. And then uh, beta carotene excess can cause like a yellowish palms of the hands. Um, I actually knew a dental hygienist uh, when I was a, an, an assistant, and she ate carrots like all day, every day, for lunch, she would bring in a bag, an entire bag of carrots, and she would dip it into mustard and eat it. And that was her lunch every day. And I thought it was the strangest thing. Um, but she, her, the palms of her hands were seriously um, kind of orange tinted. And that she knew she had too much, but she just loved carrots. So she was going to keep eating them. So, um, you know, let her do her thing. Um, when it comes to mobility for our patient as far as their physical appearance, um, if they come in and you know they're kind of limping or maybe they're walking with a, a walker or they're, especially if they're in a wheelchair, um, they're going to have uh, limited ability in preparing their foods, in shopping, um, things like that. There, there's just a little bit more work involved with those kinds of activities. So when we, you know, we're recommending things to our patients, we may not say, hey, go to the nearest, um, you know, farmer's market in order to get fresh produce, right? Because that may not be something feasible for that patient. Um, so, you know, we're going to recommend the next best thing, which might be frozen veggies. Um, and then we also want to think about their limited dexterity and ability to perform oral care procedures. You know, so if we're seeing a lot of inflammation in um, a woman who maybe she just was was diagnosed with um, osteoarthritis in her hands, then it, it's probably not a hormone issue. It's probably more a dexterity issue. Okay, so just keep that in mind. You got to look at the whole patient to figure out what might be causing this issue. So as far as their extraoral and intraoral assessments, right, their EOIO, we want to be looking for abnormal findings and those in findings that might be interpreted with care, right? We want to be careful not to think that it's automatically a nutritional deficiency. We got to ask more questions than that. So it's probably pretty rare to find a nutrient deficiency in a healthy individual. Okay, so most of your patients, you know, if their tongue is a little red or they have some gingivitis, it's probably not caused by um, a nutritional deficiency. It could, but rule out the other stuff first. Uh, patients that are suspected of having marginal or frank nutrient deficiencies should be referred to a medical doctor and a registered dietitian immediately. Okay, don't try to treat them in the dental office. That would be um, odd. And it's, it's definitely outside our scope, so we should not do that. Um, and then obviously some nutrient deficiencies are going to require medications um, or even like um, a pharmacological doses of nutrients like thiamine and folic acid that we would be unable to to recommend in our office. So, you know, if you if you suspect uh, that kind of thing, uh, it's pretty rare. But if you suspect it's true after ruling out any of the other things it could be, then it's it's time to let um, um, a different profession take care of it. Um, as far as that uh, anthropometric evaluation, so this is the uh, anthropometric are things you can measure like physically. So uh, the patient's height and weight are anthropometric. Um, here we're able to calculate their body mass index. Uh, a patient's height and weight is recorded in the dental office, but only because um, we want to understand 
um, how much of a medication we can give them. So, you know, if the doctor is going to prescribe an antibiotic, they need to know how much the patient weighs. Um, if they're going to administer epinephrine in their local anesthetic, we need to know how much the patient weighs. This isn't usually a dental hygiene thing here in Texas anyway. Other states, it's a big deal of as far as how much does your patient weigh. Um, if there is a reduction of 10% of the usual weight over a six month period, that's gonna be significant. Um, if they lose more than 20% of their body weight, it could indicate that they have a depletion of some of their um, uh, body stores, and get like their, their nutritional uh, stores, and it's gonna affect their immune response and their ability to heal. So, you know, if it's someone who had just had bariatric surgery, um, then they're probably a bit more susceptible to infection and to um, illness than is someone who didn't just have bariatric surgery. So when we determine our patient's uh, diet history, in order to assess that nutritional status further, we need to get a, some type of screening, right, of their diet history. Uh, overall goal is going to be to determine their usual dietary habits and it, to individualize recommendations. So we don't wanna completely overhaul their diet, uh, but we just wanna give them kind of like a, hey, you know, I know you eat two servings of fruit every week, maybe consider three to four servings a week, right? It's not gonna be, you need to stop eating all the foods you eat right now and eat this a totally different diet. Never recommend that. Um, additional questioning is, it says may be necessary, is, is probably necessary to clarify the information. You're, you're probably gonna ask follow-up questions. And then inquire about food preparation. So like non-fat and diet foods, um, and the use of beverages or condiments. So, you know, if someone says, oh, you know, I only ever, you know, I don't fry any of my food, but it's like, will you buy prepackaged food that was already fried? Then you're eating fried food, okay? There's no getting around that. Um, the diet history can be evaluated based on that my plate and the dietary guidelines, okay? So those are gonna be the kinds of recommendations that you as a dental hygienist are allowed to uh, state practical tools in order to collect data on a dietary intake are going to be the 24 hour recall, the food frequency questionnaire, and a three to seven day food diary, which we're gonna talk about. You guys are probably pretty familiar with this. Okay, so the first one is a 24 hour recall. And this is basically where you sit your patient down, you say, "What? Well, every tell me everything you ate in the last 24 hours, right? This one is a retrospective data. That just means retrospective is that we are taking data that has already happened, right? We're not looking at anything in the future. Everything has happened in the past. Um, the disadvantages of a 24 hour recommend or recall uh, data is gonna be that people forget things, okay? So it's it's not always 100% accurate. Um, and then also people, sometimes they lie to us. Uh, they tell us, you know, I always floss, no. But they'll, they'll tell us, hey, you know, I ate this much of something when they maybe ate a different amount because they don't want to be embarrassed. You know, maybe they feel um, kind of, uh, judged if they tell you certain things and then also they might want to try to impress you so oh let me tell you about all this food I eat um, you know it's like social media they're only going to show you the good stuff right because they they want you to think they're cool and then um, it, it could also be that you're asking them for a day that isn't normal for them so you know if normally they work uh, you know, nine to five, and they have breakfast, lunch, and dinner, uh, but you ask them on a Monday morning, and they had Sunday, um, and, you know, it happened to be Thanksgiving, well, Thanksgiving's on Thursday, but you know what I mean, like if, if it was a holiday, or maybe they visited family, and they ate completely different foods, that's not going to be a good dietary analysis uh, data to base your recommendations off. And then advantages for the 24 hour recall is gonna be that it's quick, right? You can do it right there. You don't, they don't have to come back. Um, you can ask them all the questions that you know, they need. It only takes a minute to, to write down everything they ate the day before. The next one is the food frequency questionnaire. So this one you're asking your patient like, hey, tell me about your food habits, right? What kind of foods do you eat? Um, you know, and, and tell me about like, do you eat breakfast? Um, you know, do you 
uh, do intermittent fasting, things like that. Intermittent fasting is like super popular right now, so everybody's talking about that. Um, the purpose for your food frequency questionnaire is going to determine how often a patient consumes specific foods. So, you know, if you sat down and you were like, you know, how often do you consume uh, food and beverages, right? I'm probably going to be like, oh yeah, I only eat like, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But then you're like, okay, but like beverages. And then I'm like, oh yeah, like I, I sip on coffee all day or something like that. Um, the disadvantages for this is that it's not very specific. We're not going to figure out you have a, you know, whether or not the patient has a vitamin A deficiency through trying to figure out how often they eat food. That's not something we're going to get. Um, and then we're going to have to rely again on our patient's memory, their ability to recall the foods that they ate, which means it's not going to be 100% accurate. Um, the advantages for a food frequency questionnaire is that, you know, it, it doesn't take as much time. It's pretty simple. Um, you know, you get to talk about kind of the, the habits. And most importantly, you get to talk about how important frequency is when it comes to preventing dental cavities, right? That's going to be like the, the best part of this one. Um, and it's going to allow for analysis of food group consumptions and for carbohydrate intake. So that's what they mean here by carbohydrate intake. We get to figure out, um, you know, their carries risk when we ask these kinds of questions. All right, and then the best one is always last is going to be the food diary. So this one is the one you guys did. You're going to ask your patient to write down everything they eat for anywhere from three to seven days. And you're going to compare it to the uh, well, the RDAs, but the, the DRIs, right? You're going to compare it to the recommendations from the myplate.gov and from the dietary guidelines. Um, and you're going to look at, you know, what, uh, what they eat. And you're going to get a, a much better look at, you know, the patient's carries risk for sure, but then also any nutritional deficiencies. So the disadvantage for a food diet, as I'm sure you all rec uh, were able to see, is compliance, right? If there, if it hadn't been for a grade, I don't know if any one of you would have done it. <laughs> um, and then foods that don't get written down immediately will typically be forgotten. Um, I don't know. This, this has never happened to me, right? Because I, I never forget that I ate food before. Um, and then the time consuming to the person assessing the diet. Um, it's, you know, as a dental hygienist, you're getting paid kind of hourly based on uh, dental hygiene services that you provide for your patients. And if they have insurance that covers this, great. But if they don't, then this is something that you're going to do kind of on your own. And your dentist may or may not want you to spend time analyzing your patient's uh, nutritional counseling. It just depends on you know the dentist and, and how important they feel this is. Uh, the advantages here is you actually get a good look at what that patient uh, what the patient is eating and, and figure out if they have a risk for any deficiencies. So just like we talked about though, we're going to be comparing any, if you don't, no matter what kind of uh, nutritional assessment you have your patient do, you're going to be comparing it to my plate and to the dietary guidelines to figure out is the patient consuming the correct amount, like the tally of uh, the servings, you know, based on are you having, you know, the two to three servings of fruit and, and so on. Um, the average intake is going to be determined by obviously dividing the calories or the, the totals of each category by the number of days because that's how uh, that's how averages work and then um, you're going to use those averages compared to the my plate so you're not going to take just one day maybe they had a bad day um, you know maybe it was your weekend where you don't eat food or your weekend where you eat way too much food um, and you're gonna so the other two days will kind of balance that out and give you a better idea of what your overall intake is um, and then it's going to help to identify any deficient or excessive nutrients. And then obviously the, the best part is that it's going to figure out how karyogenic the individual's diet really is. What's nice about, you know, being able to analyze some of those dietary uh, assessments is going to be that um, a lot of them, you can just put the information into a computer and it will automatically do it for you. Like with, um, um, you know, the MyFitnessPal, it kind of has like a stock um, uh, macronutrient 
breakdown. And so, you know, if you're sort of, and you enter your stuff, it'll tell you how you compare to, um, you know, what you should be eating from macronutrients. It doesn't necessarily tell you for your micronutrients. Um, and then as far as formulating a treatment plan, so you're going to want to try to figure out what exactly is this person lacking? Excuse me, what do they lack? What do they need more of? Um, and so what issues did you identify, right? Um, is the person lactose intolerant or, you know, do they have some type of condition? Um, is the person, um, oh, this one is an example, elderly man living alone who doesn't like to cook and doesn't like to shop. Um, he's probably not going to start eating uh, the way that maybe, um, you know, a 25 year old female who lives with her family would eat, right? Um, a middle aged woman with poorly controlled diabetes and active moderate periodontitis that requires scaling and root planning and possible surgery. Um, you know, for this person, we're going to be dealing with, um, we, well, we need to boost this person's immune system as much as we can to get her to be able to, you know, not only look at her diabetes, but also to be able to get her through the healing process after scaling and replanning, right? So we're going to be talking probably about vitamin C um, and then watching her blood sugar levels. Um, for an elderly woman with dry mouth due to polypharma, uh, polypharmacia, so this one, you know, we're, we need to talk to her about maybe water and uh, sipping on water and then also maybe like biotin or a lozenge of some kind to help combat some of that dry mouth. But we need to talk to her about how, uh, her higher risk of getting cavities um, and things like that. The next one is a teenager who eats fast food and energy drinks and tells you he has tons of new cavities every time he visits the dentist. So this is someone who you really want to talk about frequency with. Um, you know, obviously you want to probably have him um, slow down on the energy drinks and, um, you know, maybe just um, have one or uh, try to replace one of those meals eating at home or something like that. But this person's definitely dealing with um, with a frequency issue, right? The number of times he's introducing fermentable carbohydrates into the mouth is going to cause that tons of, uh, of new cavities. I kind of skipped this first one with lactose intolerant. Um, so if you find a lactose intolerant adolescent or a menopausal woman, you might try to um, recommend, you know, uh, dairy alternatives. Or uh, with a postmenopausal woman, you might be recommending more uh, soy, uh, soybean products. So it just depends on the individual. Um, compliance is a lot more likely if the changes that you ask any of these people to make are pretty minimal. If, if you're not trying to get them to drastically change the things that they eat, then they're more likely to listen to you or, you know, at least consider your recommendation than they would be if you tried to uh, be more drastic with things. As far as like if you're going to be recommending nutritional recommendations to your patients, um, you're going to want to evaluate, right? So next time they come in, you're going to be like, hey, you know, how's it going? Um, you know, you know, did you consider taking whatever? Did you talk to your doctor? You know, what's happened since last time? Um, you're going to ask them those kinds of questions. And then also anytime you recommend something to your patient, like you're like, oh, yeah, I told this patient to you know, start taking a protein shake or something like that. You need to write that down um, just so that next time when they come in, you're able to be like, hey, how's the protein going? Like, you know, how's it going? Do you feel better? Like, do you have your numbers come up or, or whatever it is that, that they were using to measure that metric before. Facilitative communication skills. Um, this one's probably the, the most important aspect of trying to get your patients to change anything is going to be your communication skills. So you need to create an atmosphere of sincerity, trust, and empathy. Um, you guys will find it's, it's something called code switching, but you'll see that there's a difference in the way that um, you'll, you'll definitely see it in instructors, but even you do it. So there, there's a difference in the way you talk to your patient than the way that you talk to other professionals and, and then the way that you maybe talk to your friends and family, right? You're going to use different words in order to convey that information. And um, 
if, if you're not sure what I'm talking about, listen to the instructors. Next time they come in and they ask you a question and the difference of when they ask your patient a question. And, and let me know what you think about the, the word choice that the instructor used and even sometimes the, the tone of voice that the instructor will use. They're, it's very different um, because we want to, I don't know, we want to be calming and, and accepting of our patients. No matter what they throw at us, you got to accept them for, for where they're at. Um, you want to be very non-judgmental and non-critical. So uh, listen to what they're saying. And that means like actually listening to them, um, thinking about what they're saying as they're saying it, and, and you know, kind of, um, you know, figuring out what's important to them, right? Um, and sometimes that's mimicking some of their uh, nonverbal communication, like facial expressions, body contact, um, body movements. Um, you know, for me, it, I was never a very touchy-feely kind of person, but, um, you know, since I've gotten into dental hygiene, sometimes patients need to, I don't know, there's something about physical touch. So every so often, you know, I, I reach out and I pat them on the shoulder um, just because I, I want them to feel like, you know, I don't, I don't think they're germy and I only touch them with gloves. Like it's, I, I want them to feel comfortable with me, uh, but you never want to make them uncomfortable by kind of getting in their bubble, right? Um, and then verbal communication too. So we want to ask open question, open-ended questions, and we want to be kind of facing them and and actively listening to them so that they feel like you care about the things that they're saying. Because um, you know if you're facing the computer or you know you're you're looking away or any of those things it's going to come across like you don't care what they're saying, so they're not going to share as much. Um, I kind of like this sort of example from your book. It just talks about you know the different aspects of, of how to get people to change. So the first is explore. Um, and with this one, you need to build rapport with your patients. Um, don't expect, you know, for the very first time they ever come and see you um, that they're going to, you know, be really receptive to everything that you say. Uh, first, you have to kind of get to know them and establish that relationship. Um, you need to be positive, polite, and affirming. Um, you know, if the patient says that, you know, they um, have never had a cavity in their life and they have 20 fillings in there, um, you know, you, you, you wouldn't be like, now nah, you're lying, right? You'd be like, oh, okay, well, you know, let's talk about maybe what a cavity is and, you know, how you got those fillings and what happened. Um, ask them those kinds of questions. In order to gather behavioral history, then get to know your patient, figure out what they find important. Um, choose, so you want to provide multiple options, right? I wouldn't say to every one of my patients, hey, you got to go vegan. You know, it's the only way to live. I wouldn't say that because it, it doesn't make any sense to them, right? I want to be able to say, hey, you know, you don't need to do this thing, but maybe consider, um, you know, you having seafood twice a week or having more lentils and beans in your diet in order to reach your fiber and protein goals. Um, you want to roll with resistance. <laughs> this one is this one is hard for a lot of people, but you know sometimes you get pushback. Um, I had a patient in private practice who uh, he didn't want to hear anything about his periodontal disease, and um, every time he came in, you know if I had to probe, he would roll his eyes and um, he, a very nice guy, but he just he just didn't care. And he's like, I come in and get my teeth cleaned, and, and that's that. I don't want to hear about it. And and that's okay, you know. I I went with it, and I'm like, you know, okay, you're fine. I won't I won't bug you with this. And then slowly, you know, as he got to know me and all of that, I, I slowly started to incorporate some of those things like, oh, you know, this is looking better. I think that, you know, maybe you should try this. Or, you know, I talked to him about, hey, try floss picks. Like, I think you might like it and it'll help you get food out from between your teeth and things like that. And, and eventually he got a little better. Um, you're going to summarize by reflecting back to your patient. So, you know, if they say this thing is very important to me, you're going to be like, oh, okay, I understand how important that thing is to you. Um, you want to stay focused. So sometimes patients will kind of go off on tangents and talk about other stuff and you don't want to do that. That kind of takes away from your appointment time and also the amount of time you have to educate them on the things that they're actually there for. Um, anticipate barriers. So, you know, if your patient is 
um, you know, of a, of a low socioeconomic status and, you know, for sure that, you know, they, they can't afford certain things, maybe don't recommend that they go to Whole Foods for shopping, right? You're going to, you're going to kind of try to help them um, deal with the kinds of, of barriers that they have. You know, maybe they have a language barrier. And so, uh, you know, of a, of a farmer's market where they speak that specific language, then, then have them go there, you know, figure out ways that can make your patient's life easier. Um, in guiding them, you want to try to determine their motivation, their reason for change, their interest and commitment, um, and you want to illuminate what those changes will look like for that patient. So, you know, if you're like, uh, when it comes to tobacco cessation, you know, if you're like, hey, the average person who smokes spends $2,292 um, a year on cigarettes you know what do you think you could do with two thousand two hundred and ninety two dollars like how much do you think that that um, you know would either save you or maybe um, you know you'd be able to to do this other hobby with um, you know really get them kind of on the same page with like oh maybe there's a reason behind um, this change and then that is, uh, that is the end of chapter 21. So um, let me know if you have questions.